Welcome back. We're here today with our second host call of the weekend. Thanks for joining me here today. Hopefully you tuned into episode 1905 yesterday. That's at stephencabral.com forward slash 1905, where we talked about rebalancing female hormones like estrogen, progesterone, and even DHEA. We spoke about peanut allergies and six-month-old based protocols. We spoke about uh, potential leaky gut and chronic hives and what the issue might be with taking acid blockers for many years, talked about the 16-8 diet and why some people actually gain weight on it. Then we spoke about a methyl donor called trimethylglycine and why it's so important to take, especially if you have methylation-based defects in your genes or taking certain nutritional supplements. The last question we went over was about blood sugar and what's actually normal for blood sugar to rise after a meal. So hopefully you tuned into yesterday's show today. I don't know what the questions are because I open my document at the same time I begin and start this show. That's the way that I like to do it. I like the questions and I like the answers to be very raw. You know, it's whatever someone wrote in, I don't change it. And my answer is my answer without doing any extra research or anything like that. I just want to share with you what I've been able to experience and what I've seen over, let's say, now over 20 years in clinical practice. And, uh, and that includes health and fitness and functional medicine and integrative health and all those great things as well as just reading, again, reading thousands of books, being able to experience working with many mentors and sharing everything that I've seen with you. And I try to do that in the concisest um, a possible manner. And hopefully, like I said, even if the question isn't meant for you, maybe you'll be able to pass on the information to someone else it could serve. So today's first question is from... Drum roll, Monique. All right, Monique is writing in saying, Hi, Dr. Brawl. I've discovered you after listening to a podcast where Melissa Ambrosini interviewed you and it's changed my life so much. Thank you for all you do. I appreciate that, Monique. And uh, Melissa's a good friend of mine. She started out as just someone I met uh, within the industry. Um, Nick brought her, so I never talk out of turn, but Nick, her husband, uh, has obviously shared many times how I've worked with him and helped him with his health. And I've been on Melissa's podcast now many times and she's, she's a good friend. So thank you for that, by the way. So Monique's question is, I have a question about an herb found called cat's claw. It says cat's claw is an immune stimulant rich in proanthocyanidin, a powerful antioxidant and free radical scavenger. This combined with its white blood cell increase in effect, makes it effective in the treatment of cancer. It cleanses the intestinal tract, assists with Crohn's disease, arthritis, hemorrhoids, parasites, leaky bowel syndrome, ulcers, gastritis, allergic disorders, diverticulitis, and other gastrointestinal disorders. I also help, it also helpful for chemotherapy recovery. It says to simmer one teaspoon in one cup of water for 10 minutes and take three times a day. I'm wondering if you've heard of it and what your views are. Thanks for your time. All right. Well, two things. So one is I've studied pretty much all herbs there are, all the popular ones at least, many, many hundreds. And that is because I am a huge advocate of herbal medicine. I believe herbs, which are plants, are medicine, and they were given to us in order to be able to heal. Now, there is no company in the world that should make claims like that on the back of a packet, even if they are true, because it's completely illegal to make claims like that. And I, I hope that uh, we won't state the company's name, but we hope that the FDA does not come after them because you can't make claims like that because those are medical claims. So I'm not going to make those claims. However, cat's claw is used for multiple reasons inside of natural health. One is it's used in the gut. So it's actually used as a scavenger in the gut, as well as something that can help to heal the gut, rebalance the gut. So it's nice in that way. Um, I don't use it a ton, uh, but I've actually used it in certain viral-based protocols, or I should say certain protocols such as a tick bite. I talked about a couple of years ago, I got bit in Maine by a tick. I was in there for about a day, found it on my leg. I was just not happy at all because I've worked with so many hundreds of people, uh, maybe thousands with Lyme. And of course, I know how disruptive it can be to your health. So I went right away into my, you know, my natural medicine bag and I didn't have all these products available. So I went to my local natural health food store and I actually picked up all the products that I use. And if you want to find out what I use for a tick bite, again, it's not a medical treatment protocol, then you can just go to stephencabal.com forward slash podcast 
Type in Tick Bite and you'll find it. Or always feel free to ask at cabralsupportgroup.com if you can't find the podcast. But anyway, Cat's Claw was one of those that I used. All right. So I don't know exactly what you're using it for because it doesn't say. Uh, but it's a good product. I wouldn't use it every day unless you need it. So I used it for three weeks during my Tick Bite protocol and then I haven't used it since. So you don't, your herbs are medicine. So you use them when you need them. All right, Kelly's up next. Hello, Dr. Brawl. I was diagnosed with atypical hypoplasia in one of my breasts eight months ago. I had the area surgically removed and no cancer was detected. I am now taking tamoxifen, 20 milligrams daily to reduce the risk of breast cancer. I'm working with a naturopath who works specifically with people who have cancer or who are at risk. He has me on a protocol that includes 20 milligrams of melatonin. I had to work up to that amount over time over a few weeks, but now I'm fine with it. My question though is I've noticed my morning blood sugar is higher than what my levels typically are. I used to wake up with a blood glucose level between 75 and 85. Now it's typically between 95 and 105. I eat a mostly paleo diet, exercise six days a week, and keep myself very hydrated. So my question is, can that much melatonin have an impact on my blood sugar levels? This is why I love doing the house calls because I've never gotten this question before. And I've never even had to think about this question before because I don't put anyone on 20 milligrams of long-term melatonin. Have I used 20 milligrams before? Very rarely, like on on the one hand in 20 years. Um, My typical dosage is two and a half to five milligrams for most people. People that have a really difficult time getting to sleep, 10 milligrams for maybe three weeks, and then we just gradually reduce that by uh, a milligram or two each week until we get down to maybe a maintenance dose of two and a half milligrams. 20 milligrams dramatically changes your hormone production because now you're starting to get in the territory of what your body would start to produce. So I'm not going to say that your naturopath is wrong. Melatonin is a powerful anti-cancer-based hormone. I just, I don't do things unless they're needed in terms of supplementation. So I use the daily foundation protocol. Yes. I do the immunity protocol. Yes. I use a few anti-aging products. Yes. Okay. Those are things that I know my body needs. Like, they need that. Um, you can make a case that your body doesn't need resveratrol. I agree with you, right? I agree with that. Um, but you can't make a case that your body doesn't need B vitamin, zinc, vitamin C, et cetera. So I do that. Now, I also use a little melatonin. I've talked about that before. I use two and a half milligrams a night and it's a game changer for me because I'm the type of person who I don't like to sleep in the first place. My mind's always going, not in a bad way, I'm not anxious at all. I'm not nervous. I just have a lot of, I'm always working through things in my mind in a good way. I love it. I love puzzles in life. I love problems to solve. It's very strange, but it's who I am. And, and I enjoy that person, so I don't try to change it. Um, so that's that. So the melatonin though at night just helps turn it off. I could see in a roundabout type of way that if you lower cortisol too much, it could have an effect on blood sugar. I don't know that. This is just me kind of working through it and talking through it. But the, the thing is this, this is what we do. So this is, I, I did this, I mean, I'm going to share this with you right now. Um, episode 1893, it was a motivation and mindset Monday. The way that we're able to figure all of this out for anyone who works with us in our practice or anybody runs a lab at equi.life forward slash labs is that we work variables. Let's say we thought that your elevated glucose, which is too high, by the way, it's, it's not a fair trade-off. You don't want high glucose more than you want to take more melatonin. So maybe melatonin is a great part of a natural anti-cancer routine. Again, I'm not saying that it is, but maybe it is, okay? What I'm saying is this, if it causes high blood sugar, well, now you have a greater chance for cancer. Because right now, we're not saying you have a chance for cancer. We're saying you remove the atypical cells, which by the way, doesn't necessarily mean cancer, but yes, there's some, there's some mutated or cells that are atypical, right? No, you remove them. I'm not against that. I I could say, well, that's smart. I think it might be a good idea. But Here's the issue. Now blood sugar is high. What I would do, but again, work with your naturopath, is you may want to remove or just reduce your melatonin to 5 milligrams a night from 20 and see if your blood sugar returns to normal over the course of four to six weeks. And if that's the only variable you changed, well, you know it was the melatonin and the dosage that you're taking is just a bit too high. Maybe you'll find, and again, we, I talk about it on that show. If you only use that as a variable, you might find maybe seven milligrams is good for you, but not 20, right? So you'll eventually find your sweet spot working with your naturopath. All right, Laura's up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. I recently took your three-day bacteria and parasite stool test. My results came back with a level one of candida 
paracillosis. Is this treated the same way that the other types of candida are treated? I'd love to hear from you regarding what causes this and how to treat it. Thank you so much for your time and expertise. We're all getting a little smarter because of you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate that. And uh, I like to say that uh, me reading every single day and doing research, I, I try to get a little smarter uh, and pass that along to other people. So we're all just paying it forward. That's really what it's all about. Uh, Okay, so this form of candida is becoming more prevalent. You probably wouldn't have even seen this, maybe, well, hardly anybody's running this lab 30 years ago, uh, but, they, but the lab was around. So, okay, this particular type of candida is still a yeast. So remember, just keep in mind, we don't treat anything. We don't treat things that's medical, that's, that's conventional medicine, all right? So what we do is we go about rebalancing the body. All right, that's what we do. So this type of candida, there are many types of candida. Candida albicans is what gets the most press, the most media. But it's, it's just the most popular, we'll say. But they're all forms of yeast and fungus, which means they're all rebalanced in the same way, which means we would start to use the CBO protocol. All right, so that's it. Hopefully that's helpful. Oh, you asked how you get it. It, it lives on the skin of animals and other bugs. Uh, it can be found in the soil. Anything like that. So, yeah, that's how you get it. Okay, Tom's up next. Hey, George Brawl. First of all, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with the community. So everyone knows that they must, so everyone knows that they must exercise and that there are a lot of benefits for it. But why should you exercise? If you're healthy, happy, weight is good, you're fit, why should exercise still be a must? Well, it's a great question. I love the question. I've actually never been asked by that. Like, hey, why exercise? Because, Tom, I'm, I'm with you in the philosophy that you shouldn't necessarily do more than you need to in order to be healthy because doing more is not necessarily healthy. So if, let me give you an example. We all need methylfolate, right? It's the methylated form of folic acid. And there's debate. Some people need 400. Uh, I know that the milligrams have now changed. It's like 333 micrograms. But some people might need 333. Some people might need... Um, over 600. That's based on the individual. But only very few people would need three to 4,000 milligrams, like a massive amount, or micrograms, sorry about that, three to 4,000 micrograms. Very small, much smaller amount. So you don't want to overdo folic acid because it can be toxic to you. You just, you don't want to overdo it. But we want to understand is that humans, as a living thing, was meant to move. So when you look at the de-stress protocol that I wrote up, diet, exercise, stress reduction, toxin removal, rest, emotional balance, science-based supplements, and success mindset, exercise is in there because exercise actually regulates mitochondria, muscle mass, which equals metabolism, which equals longevity because it helps with strength. It helps with fall prevention, coordination. Exercise stimulates the nervous system. Exercise moves the lymphatic system. Exercise helps with neurotransmitters and the mind and mood. Exercise is good for the brain. It moves the glymphatic uh, tissue as well. So, I mean, I could go on and on. I mean, exercise is a natural anti-inflammatory one, not overdone. So exercise is a must. Here's the thing. A lot of us, I thought I was healthy. I thought I was happy up until I got sick. So the thing is, we're all filling up our rain barrel unless we're paying attention. And exercise, even if it's not your favorite, has to be done because you're human. So you need to mimic some type of human movement. Now, you could just walk. You don't need to go for a jog. You could walk. But you also need some type of strength-bearing activity to stimulate, or I shouldn't say stimulate. Yeah, stimulate's a good one, but also simulate human movement. So you're going to do things in a sagittal plane, a frontal plane, and a transverse plane. And if you don't know what those are, you can go back to a previous training Thursday of mine, and you can just type in three planes of movement, and you'll be able to find out what those are. So it's a must. It also helps with what's called apoptosis inside the body. So it regulates cell death, program cell death. Uh, the weak cells die, they make more healthy cells. So these are all, it affects your telomere length. So Tom, I like the question. Hopefully, I gave you enough reasons to start an exercise program. Again, more days than not. That's it. Just more days than not. You know, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, pick a weekend day, half hour, 40 minutes, you're going to be good to go. 
Christine is up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. I hope you're doing great. This There's this weird health question that's been on my mind. Uh-oh, here we go. <laughs> and I figured that if anyone would know the answer, it would be you. So I'm 40 years old, female, and I've been celibate for over four years. When I was in a relationship, my periods were normal and regular. After my relationship ended, not so much. One month, they are 29 days, the other 42, and so on. Can it be the fact that I'm not having sex anymore that's influencing my hormones and making my periods irregular? I know it's a weird question, but I have a gut feeling that this could be it. I'm super curious to hear your thoughts about it. Thanks a million, Christina. So it's not a weird question at all. I don't even know. I mean, I understand that, you know, maybe it's a Sometimes these are considered like taboo topics, but they really shouldn't be. This is part of normal human physiology. This is, again, not a weird question. And the answer is your gut feeling may actually be absolutely on par. So when men and women have sex, it changes their hormones while having sex and directly after having sex. So you do want to keep that in mind. And testosterone is one of those main hormones as well. Your testosterone uh, will boost, but actually then it can dip the next day or so and then boost back up. So it absolutely can be affected by this. However, just keep in mind that it may be just completely coincidental. So you're 40 years old. You're, you might have lowering, not, not all the way. Again, I'm not saying that you're entering menopause because I can't, again, I'm not going to give you that diagnosis, but you may actually see yourself starting to dip a bit in terms of your DHEA which affects your testosterone, which affects your estrogen. And if you've had increased stress at all, you might see a decrease in your progesterone. So there's always an explanation. This could just be coincidental. You might actually start to see a little following of the falling of the hormones, but you can get a natural boost, um, but you want it really customized for you. So what I would do is I would run one lab. Again, I'd love you to run the big five. Of course, the big five is you get the most amount of data. But if you can only run one labs out of the big five, I would run the stress, mood, and metabolism test that goes through your estrogen and your progesterone. It goes through your uh, DHEA and your testosterone, your cortisol throughout the day, your thyroid hormones, and then it also goes through vitamin D, hemoglobin A1C, and insulin. If your periods are irregular, you want to take it somewhere about a week before menstruation would typically happen. And that might be the time you're having the most symptoms. So if you ever feel any bloating or low mood or irritability or more oily skin or any cramping or bloating, that's the time to take that test. So if you do that, the nice thing is this. We can assess exactly where you're at, which hormones are high or low, which ones might be out of balance, and just give you the boost that you need to get your body back on track. And of course, that's all natural. We don't use any hormones in our practice, no bioidenticals, anything like that. We just work with nature and with your body to be able to work as to what the root cause is for this. So hopefully that was helpful. Uh, we got through our six questions today, right? So we got Monique, two, three, four, five. Do we get f five or six? One, two, three, four, five. Well, I like to do six, so we're gonna do one more question for today. All right, Dar is up next and will be our last questionnaire. All right, hi, love the show, big fan. I have a two-part question. Do you know anyone that's gone through the mucusless diet based on uh, Arnold Eret's results? And if so, how do they feel? The guy ate leafy greens and fruits exclusively and was able to hike up mountains while fasting, walk 56 hours consecutively, and bike, I believe, something like 1,000 kilometers at one time, which for a non-athlete is mind-blowing. Also, how do you... How long do you think it would take the average person to clean their bowels on a juice fast? I'm on day eight and surprisingly had a bowel movement. Ate the SAD diet up until the last few years, now getting more plant-based. Yeah, this is a great question. I actually um, did a podcast Friday review on the mucusless diet. I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, don't, I mean, I'll let you do it. You, go, you can go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts and you can just type in uh, mucusless diet and you should find that there. Uh, it um, revolves around mainly vegetables and herbs. Uh, there, you can have some fruit for sure. And what it's doing is it's a highly alkaline diet. I know that's like a lightning rod word for many people, uh, but what it does is it's essentially a massive detoxification-based plan for the body. Uh, again, does it work for all? Not for all. Again, I've done very similar when I was on Ayurvedic diets, and I can tell you that I didn't have 
great energy. I, I had terrible energy. Some people might have great energy. Now, is it unhealthy? I don't think it's unhealthy for a short period of time. I think, it's, I think it would be unhealthy if a person wasn't getting adequate amino acids, uh, which is about 0.8 grams uh, of protein per kilogram of body weight. Uh, again, I'm, you know I'm not a huge heavy protein person. I'm not that at all because I've read the research and I, show what, I see what happens when someone's on a high protein diet. Uh, but a lot of people are not and they end up be becoming very catabolic. And again, that does not happen in the beginning. It typically happens after months or years. So I like the work. I mean, I read the book, enjoy the book. I really do, but it doesn't mean that I have to go out and follow all of it. Um, okay, what else? Uh, how long does it take to someone to empty their bowels? Well, you can empty your bowels completely within 24 hours. So just think about all the people going for a colonoscopy. Their bowels are completely empty, at least, at least the last five to six feet of that. And for the most part, the whole thing, because you're taking a solution that empties your bowels, literally. So we have something called the five-day intestinal cleanse. The five-day intestinal cleanse will empty your bowels as well. And it's all herbal-based. So you can use this if you want, along with your mucusless diet. And that's at equa.life. Um, and you can just type in intestinal cleanse and you'll find it. It's five days. And what it does is it allows you to get rid of all of the built-up fecal matter on those bowels. So that's what I'd recommend. Nothing wrong, Dar, with a little bit of self-experimentation. Just make sure it doesn't get taken too far. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Appreciate you. I really do. Thank you so much for all the reviews of the podcast. If you haven't left a review yet, I would love you to do that on your favorite podcast player. Take care, have a great weekend, and I'll be back tomorrow with our Mindset and Motivation Monday. 